Let me take you back to April 1988. Computer Shopper. I was writing for Computer Shopper. This was the second edition. I did a, another video recently about the first edition of Computer Shopper and I was quite surprised when I was going through it at how much had changed and a few things that hadn't. Now, what's this one? The top story is save money the MIDI way by adding sound to video. Uh, and also you can upgrade your PC to 386 power for £799. Anyway, let me go through a couple of the things that struck my attention when I was browsing through this. First of all, a piece that I wrote, this is a programming piece about Modular 2. It's called Marvelous, Marvelous Modular. And it's about JPI, Jensen Partners International, Modular 2. Now, Modular 2 was a, pro well, it still is a programming language that is based or grew out of Pascal. It was developed uh, as a more modular, uh, as a more modular sort of Pascalish sort of language. Now I've got here the, the introduction. When I first heard about JPI Modular 2, my reaction was one of ex extreme skepticism. Not only uh, was it yet another cheap compiler, yawn, I put in brackets, just in case you haven't realized how tedious the idea of cheap compilers was at that time, but it didn't even have the decency to be a compiler in a mainstream language like C or Pascal, Worse still, it was the first release from a completely unknown company, one based not in the US, but in the UK. Now, it turned out that the company had actually been set up by Niels Jensen, who was one of the founders of Borland, famous for Turbo Pascal and other products, and they had been developing a modular to, uh, it was supposed to be a turbo modular product, that never got off the ground, so he up sticks, came to London, brought some of his team with him and started work on their own on a product that eventually became known as Top Speed Modular 2. My conclusion, now I, I really grew to like Modular. Uh, JPI Modular 2 is a landmark product, I say. Until now, Modular 2 has remained a relatively obscure programming language uh, on the PC, uh, overshadowed by Turbo Pascal and increasingly by C. JPI has finally created a system which this powerful language des deserves. I uh, I thought that, you know, I was hoping, I suppose, that Modular 2 might have offered a more significant alternative to C. That didn't really happen, sadly, but there you go. Uh, let's have a look what else is in here. Uh, now, ah, this is my column. Rants and raves. So I used to write this every month and it was just me writing about whatever took my fancy that month. Uh, talking about some DTP programs, some inst installation programs, game, Beyond Zork, where I've always liked adventure games. And so it's not surprising that I was writing about that. But to get back to C, I was just talking about Modular 2 and C. There's a little section here called Sea Wars. As everybody and their grandmother seems determined to bring out a cheap C compiler for the PC, the real war seems to be raging between two companies, Microsoft and Borland. Now at this point, Borland was really quite a, seen as a, quite a big challenge to Microsoft. Now last month I admitted to a grudging acceptance of Microsoft's claims for Quick C's superiority over Turbo C. Quick C was Microsoft's uh, response to Borland's turbo range. Microsoft actually launched a, t a quick Pascal as well, because turbo Pascal was then dominant. When Borland launched a C product, Microsoft was competing with quick C. Now I admitted last month the su quick C superiority over turbo C. This month I'm not so sure anymore. The reason being, I've just got hold of a copy of the Turbo C update, version 1.5, and it's got almost all the things that Microsoft has been carping about, and some more good things besides um, graphic modules and, I don't know, various other things. But anyway, we know that uh, C eventually did continue to become a major product. But what about C++? Well, I've got mention of that too. C++ wasn't yet really quite well, it wasn't 
a dom- it was more of a evolving, yeah, it was quite a new technology for most people. But there was a company here called Zortec, a UK company uh, that launched a cheap C++ compiler. Oh yes, I say there are other C++ systems, but they don't compile. There were there were systems that uh, there was one called Glockenspiel. I remember that that um, it sort of translated into standard C. I I think if I remember right. But anyway, this is a full C++ compiler, and I have to explain what C++ is. For those of you who've never heard of C++, I'd better explain. It's a, a moderately obscure obscure. This is 1988 obscure variant of C which adds object-oriented extensions. And then I have to explain what object orientation is. For those of you who've never heard of object orientation, I say, I haven't got the slightest intention of going into the subject here. It was something that, you know, people were starting to discover at that point. But anyway, Zortex C++ was well ahead of the game, coming up with a, a version that was quite cheap to buy and uh, a full compiler. Then I go on to artificial intelligence, 1988. Yep. Okay. So everybody's talking about AI now, but here I've got artificial intelligence is a very fashionable concept in computing these days. That's probably because it's vague and impressive sounding. Actually, I think not much has changed. Uh, I mean, surely something with artificial intelligence must be better than something without it, mustn't it? The only problem is that nobody knows precisely what artificial intelligence really is. Yeah, nothing much has changed. Uh, one of the main areas of AI research is natural language. Okay, so it's a bit confusing because people, even to this day, talk about artificial intelligence as though everybody agrees on what intelligence is. But natural language was always seen as um, one of the main areas of research of artificial intelligence. And in 1988, there was a database, a program called Q&A, that accepts instructions such as, and you could type it in, please find all the records of employees earning more than £20,000 and list them alphabetically. It's the sort of thing you put into Grok or, or chat GPT, or, you know, full sentence. Well, in those days, that was quite unusual. Uh, you know, I compare it with the syntax for normal database queries, which is for employees with salary and then a little pointy arrow to indicate, great, ind indicate greater than 20,000, etc. do list by name. Um, and then I go on to talk about how games had actually been some of the programs that had pushed forward this uh, idea of, of natural language. And there was, a, a, again, a British company called Magnetic Scrolls that were launching some, some games, some adventure games, and they were pushing the boundaries of the commands you could put in. So you could put in here, I'll give some examples, pick up the document and the ticket and look at them. And uh, what else? Put the harmonica in the bottle with the keys, put the keys inside the bottle with the harmonica, etc, etc. So this was a, a game called Jinkster, and it was trying to allow a greater range of, of language. One of the other things that was, it was a passing technology really, but it was quite big at the time, was pop-up programs. So I mentioned in a previous video about Sidekick. Sidekick was another ball and product that let you pop up a, a, a little word processor and calculator and ASCII tape and various other tools just by pressing some keys and, and whatever program you were using, Sidekick would pop up over the top. It's called Terminate and Stay Resident. You have to remember that this is back in the days of MS-DOS and you couldn't just have different programs running in different windows. You only ran one program at a time where Sidekick broke the rules because it popped up over whatever program you were running. I got to know um, a chap called Stephen Brimley slightly, who was a developer in Britain, who did a pop-up word processor called Top Copy. And I asked him, because I didn't know how, he, how these things worked. So I asked him to give us a practical guide to TSR. That's Terminate and Stay Resident Programming. And so he does, complete with all the assembly language listings explaining how it worked. So Computer Shopper in those days was kind of an unusual 
computer magazine in Britain because it had not only the obvious things like reviews of the latest laptop PCs, a sharp uh, lightweight PC and um, guides to, what have we got here, buying a daisy wheel printer. So it had all that sort of thing, plus you get really quite technical programming pieces like how to write, terminate and stay resident programs. Okay, that's just a quick nostalgic look back to the second edition of Computer Shopper and what was going on in the world of computing in April 1988. If you like this, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe to my channel, all the rest of it, and I'll be back again shortly with something probably totally different.